got this stupid cast on. But um, besides that, uh, everything's good. Everything is uh, on the up and up. Nice. And I know you've had a time to step back a little bit and kind of reflect on it and soak it in. I mean, registering a title defense, going through a, you know, such a, a rivalry battle like that was. I mean, now that you've had a chance to kind of enjoy it a little bit, what did, what did that fight mean to you? <laughs> this is a, a feeling that I've always had all through, um, all through my career as a, as a martial artist. Back when I was wrestling and I made the decision that I wanted to be the best at one point in whatever I was doing is uh, I don't too much, I don't, I just, I don't soak it up as much. It's as soon as I'm done, you know, it's that, those few hours, of course, the world, everyone is, is blowing up your social media, everyone's, you know, big up in you, hey, hey, good job, good job. But then there's that moment when I go to my room and I'm by myself, uh, my manager always loves to be in my room, but I, I have to kick him out sometimes because I want some privacy by myself. And, uh, and I'm just in there and then I, I think to myself, what's next? That's done, that's over with. What's next? And that's kind of the feeling I'm getting now. It's just, I'm sitting at home, taking my daughter to school. I come back on the couch and I'm just watching TV. And you know what, actually now I'm getting into the, the UFC three game. So it's pretty cool to just be able to get my ass whooped by uh, fans all over the world as my own self. <laughs> You know, you mentioned it, what's next? I mean, so that's what people are starting to talk about. Your name has been coming up this week, especially with Conor McGregor. He's saying, listen, uh, you know, this is a welterweight bout, you know, maybe lightweight, but I think I could challenge for 170 gold as well. So what do you think about the idea of, of Conor McGregor, if he wins on Saturday night, potentially challenging you and facing off for your welterweight belt? You know, I'm the champion. Um, that, that's, that's it, plain and simple. I am the champion. They have to come to me. There's a reason now they talk about me, and that's because I have the gold. So anybody can get it. I have never said no. When Dana White calls and says, I want you to take out this guy, I say when, and we get it done. So I'm not the one picking and choosing fight. I've never turned down a fight ever in my career. I've been the one begging for fights. But now I'm in a situation, I'm in a position to where I don't have to beg for fights anymore. They have to come to me. If Connor wants it, Connor can get it too. You know, um, I, I don't discriminate on the ass whooping. I, I, anybody can get it. On that tip, Jorge Masvidal was here earlier as well, and he said, listen, he wants to fight. Um, and it's kind of getting personal to him a little bit. He said he, he doesn't like the, the trash talk that he feels is coming from you at this point, um, and, and, and he'd like to potentially have a fight with you as well. I talked to Dana yesterday. He said he feels like Jorge is probably the number one contender right now. What, what about that? I know you say you'll take it from anybody, but is that fight more appealing to you, say, than Conor McGregor? Who? <laughs> <laughs> Um, like I said, anybody can get it. When Dana says that's the guy, I say when. You know, Dana said uh, um, Covington was the guy, when. I got it done. He said Woodley was the guy, when. I got it done. So it doesn't matter. Whoever they put in front of me, it's my job as a champion to go in there and shoot him down. Last thing for me, when, when, when's good for you? I mean, if you were the one making the call, I mean, obviously you got the cast on there, but what does look ideal for you in, in 2020? When, when, when would you like to fight? You know, the one thing that I, I, I do love now is the fact that, you know, now it's more of a, of a partnership. Um, with obviously with, with what makes sense for Dana and the company and also my management, you know, I have, uh, you know, best management in the game and so you know they go in and they sit down with Dana and we figure out a time you know that that works for both of us and we go in there and we get it done it's not a matter of opponent it's a matter of of when the champion wants to get back in there and, and do his job uh Kamara just over here uh Jorge was out here just a few seconds ago and he was mentioning you guys uh, had some of the same trainers that are working with you now he mentioned that the trainers are saying telling you to avoid him that he's a tough matchup. I just want to clarify it and give you a chance to sort of clear this up. <laughs> what, are, what are they saying to you? What, what, what is it like working with his ex-coaches? Is there one person in here who believes somebody of the way that I fight, they would tell me to avoid anybody? No, not possible. Actually, uh, it's funny. Uh, there's a trainer that, that used to be at ATT that now works with us. And what these guys don't understand is, that's what I say, I, I'm not here by accident. 
you know, this is, this is definitely written. That trainer happens to be my first ever wrestling coach when I was a kid. You know, guy c came over from, you know, overseas and was my first wrestling coach in high school at 13 years old. And then I go off to college. I don't see this guy for years and years. And then he somehow ends up in mixed martial arts. I end up in mixed martial arts, and now he's my coach again. So why would they tell me to avoid anybody? That's the one thing that that coach knows is, is who I am and what I'm capable of. Uh, obviously, a lot of people sort of trying to get George St. Pierre to come out of retirement and come back for one more fight. You're building yourself, you know, a really impressive legacy. Do you think he could be the guy that gets George to come out for one more fight and possibly fight you for his possibly last fight ever in the UFC? Actually, yeah, that's the fight that, um, to be honest, that really gets me up, that gets me motivated, that intrigues me. Of course, I do my job. When, it, when I sign down a dotted line to fight anybody, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go in there and do my job. But, you know, a fight with someone like George is a fight that, that, that makes me think, that wakes me up because, you know, George is someone that's special to the mixed martial arts world. A guy that actually has the, the record right now currently that I'm chasing. And, and what better way to, to, you know, cement my legacy by actually going out there and, and breaking that record against that man because he hasn't really lost. You know, he walked away and he's still in tip top shape. He can come back as he showed, you know, what a couple years ago with Bisping. He can come back and still get it done. So that is a fight that intrigues me a lot. And that is something that I'm looking forward to. Just last one from me. Um, I'm guessing you'll be cage side for the big fight this weekend. Potentially. After the fight, if McGregor does start calling you out, saying things to you about the title, are you anticipating maybe some kind of a beginning of almost a promo, just like Masvidal did with Nate, where the back and forth begins? Is that sort of what you're waiting for to really sort of say, all right, I'm happy to fight you now? Well, no, because uh, this would be former champion in a different weight class versus actual champion. So it's not that other that you mentioned it's it's not a comparison to that you know i mean like i said i don't discriminate with the ass whooping uh, uh if connor wants it connor can get it too you know i'm the champion my job is to go in there and make it happen if dana decides that hey he wants to throw this guy in the mix then <laughs> i'm gonna do my job you know um connor has, has you know he's been also he's special to the uh world of mixed martial arts and that's the thing with me is uh I'm no hater. I give credit where credit is due. That young man is definitely, uh, he's, he's done a lot for the sport. So if he feels that um, he wants to, you know, step in and, and, and challenge, you know, that's try he's trying to make history to, to actually fight for a third title. I mean, I, I would be stupid to stand in the way of history and, and give him that opportunity. So, you know, Connor can get it too if he wants it. Champ over here to your right. You have a great uh, image, and, and you're a really good role model. How important is it to you to, uh, to be that? You know, when I was growing up, um, I just I had a lot of different people just touch my life in different ways. And it, and it could be just, you know, somebody, that, uh, or the, the UFC staff, the security back there. You know, at some point, whether they realize it or not, indirectly, they've touched my life. You know, being able to walk by and see the smile on their face or seeing how they do their job, you know, things like that. And I've, I've been blessed to be touched by people like that all through my life, whether it's my coaches, whether it's my parents. And so they, they've set an example for me. And that's the example as a parent now that I have to set for my, my daughter. This is not fake. This is who I really am. You know, a lot of guys like to put on an act that they're fake tough guys, that they're gangsters or this and that. I'm not a gangster. I never sold any any drugs or anything like that. You know, yes, I, I had a rough childhood coming from, you know, borderline poverty from where I grew up. But at the end of the day, I still got here. And I still have those key and core values. Like, so I, I don't have to formulate anything. This is not me trying to do anything. This is just me being how I was raised. Absolutely. Was there ever any time coming up that people were putting a bug in your ear to do something different, to start being crazy Kamaro Usman and say things? How close were you to, uh, to maybe doing something like that? At all? No, absolutely. They do that now. I mean, because let's, let's be honest. Um, me being real and being the way that I am, it, it's never going to be, especially in this day and age, it's never, I'm never going to get the credit 
that someone who's outlandish or that or the attention or someone who's that extremely outlandish like some of these other guys are going to get. But that's fine with me because at the end of the day, when I go home and when this is all said and done, I'm still the same person. You know, these guys have to somehow turn it off. Or well, these guys can put on an act and be as outlandish as possible, and they can get a lot of attention, get a lot of recognition. But what happens when you're not that guy anymore, when that, all that attention is gone? How are you going to handle it? And so, I, I'm, I mean, they... There is a lot of pressure because some guys, uh, you know, people talk, a lot of the media talk. Is, and some of the medias, they don't, give me, they don't give me the credit. You know, they're, oh, he's just, uh, you know, a champion. He's just going to come out and give us the same thing, and, and he's going to be respectful or be this. And, you know, they want, they want headlines. They want stuff to talk about, they, whether it's good, bad, or ugly. They don't care. But at the end of the day, I care. So I have to be myself. Last question for me. Back when you won the Ultimate Fighter, Black Zillions versus American Top Team, I remember everyone was talking about Hader Hassan. And then uh, when all said and done, the winner is Kamaro Usman. And people are like, wait a second, what happened? And you really made an impression there. How important was that win? And are there still some feelings of animosity between uh, the re remaining people of the Black Zillions and American Top Team? No, I mean, that, that was tough. That fight was extremely tough because I had just come off of um, – I had microfracture surgery in my knee, and that was supposed to be an eight-month, nine-month recovery before I started doing stuff again. And I fought, what, three months after that? And so, um, you know, that, that was very tough, and especially, you know, you were fighting for a team, and there was 300,000 house on the line, so I uh, couldn't can fuck that one up. So, you know, there was a lot, there was a lot riding on that, but... You know, when I got into the sport, I, I knew that I wanted to be a champion, and I knew that I was going to do everything possible to become a champion. And so, you know, once we got over that, it was what's next. We got over the next hump. It was what's next, what's next. And ultimately, now I'm here at this point. And so um, what was the second part of your question? Um, the Black Zillions. Uh, um, I, I've pretty much ran through the whole gym, I, 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 pretty much so. Uh, the welterweights that they all have over there, I've pretty much beat them all. So for me, there's, there was never really any animosity. It was just, you know, when you have two close, two powerhouse gyms in, that, in close proximity like that, there's going to be some for, for form of tension. But for me, no, if I see those guys, like, you know, I have guys that I love over there, Amanda Nunes, uh, Dustin Poirier. There's a, I don't, you know, not animosity toward those guys. Last quick one. If you fought Masvidal and he comes with a flying knee like Ben Askren, you have anything in store for him? <laughs> Well, first of all, I'm not Ben Askren. And so, um, you know, I just take the fight how they come. If that fight does happen, then, you know, I'll go in there and do my job, which is dominate an opponent from start to finish, you know, maybe get another broken jaw. Who knows? Thank you, champ. Thank you. Hey, Kamara, just over here uh, on your other side, just over here, just wondering, like, you sort of not acknowledging Masvidal and saying who every time you ask about him. <laughs> it's kind of taken on a, a life of its own. Just wondering why that is and, and why you sort of refuse to acknowledge him. No, I mean, um, this is a game to kind of where you, you need to fight the contenders that are there. And um, if you look right now, what, what – if, if there's just an average guy that's, that's looking into the sport of martial arts and they're like, oh, the welterweight champion is going to fight somebody, who is that contender? And they look through the rankings and they, they want to know who that, the next best guy is. And if you look in that top 10, I've beat half of them. I've gone through half of them in the top half of them. You know, who in that top 10 has this guy beat? You know, to me, um, is, this, is this being a contender or is this the hype? You know, there's two different things. Of course, when there's a lot of hype, people want to see the fight. Of course, they make the fight happen. But when it's, you know, a true contender that, that has been running through the division, beating all the worthy guys to get there, of course, I'll be happy to take on that because I know that's the next toughest, best challenge. That's all that is. What would he have to do to sort of get on your radar and, I guess, prove himself in your mind to be the next worthy contender? Who? Jorge Masvidal. Oh, okay. Uh, um, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, like I said, I'm the champion. If Dana calls and Dana says that's the fight, well, guess what? That's the fight. I just ask when. And, um, you know, I let my, uh, my managers go in and uh, have that meeting, and we decide when and where. Just last one from me, you know, I know you're the welterweight champion, so obviously that means a, a great deal to you, but would it mean to you anything to sort of, uh, if you fought Jorge, to fight for the BMF title and sort of, you know, add that to your collection? <laughs> Who and what? 
<laughs> well, the, the, I, I'm not interested in the best mediocre fighter title. I'm, I'm not. I'm not interested in that. That this is gold. Like um, you know, when I got into sports, I, I, I always shot for the best. You know, and, and last time I checked, the prices on on silver wasn't continuously going up. The prices on gold is going up. So, you know, I always wanted the gold, not silver. So I got the gold, and that's all matters to me. Tomorrow, right here. Kid, what exactly is the injury that you have the cast there on? I'm trying to figure that out too. I mean, I went in. Next thing you know, I'm walking out with a cast in my hand. And so, um, I mean, they they want to keep me in this thing for about three weeks, three four weeks, and and, and then see what the the strength the strength is on my uh, my thumb. But yeah, I, I was having some problems with my thumb after that. I think I uh, I might have. I don't know, done something in the fight. You know, I don't know exactly when it happened. I think it might have been the first first round in that last fight. But, um, I mean, uh, tough fight, huh? <laughs> tough fight. I didn't think it was going to go like that. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad it did. You, you seem to be embracing the, the who thing. But what do you think <laughs> of Jorge labeling you as an owl? As an ooh. <laughs> I like owls. I mean, owls are scary, actually. I mean, if, I think they could turn their hair, what, 360 degrees? Yeah, I mean, that's a scary thing. I ain't never seen anything like that. If a guy could do that to me, I, but um, I mean, it is what it is. Um, I'm just I'm just having fun with it. I mean, yeah, I'm not taking it too seriously anymore because this is something that I had to realize the, you know, is the moment you get done, people can't wait to say, oh, no, this is the next guy that can, that can dethrone you. This is the guy that's going to do it. You know, people didn't. People wrote me off. People didn't think I was going to beat Tyron Woodley. They were like, oh, even before that, I fought uh, RDA, and people were saying, oh, RDA's been a former champion. He's experienced. He was going to beat me. And I went and got it done. And then they said, oh, Tyron Woodley's got a lot of power. He's going to knock him out. And I went in and got it done. Then they said, oh, Kobe can't handle the, pray, the pace and the pressure of Kobe and the wrestling, this and that. And I went in and got it done. Like, they're always going to say something. Each and every fighter has their fan base and have people that, that, that support them and they're watching them. A lot of media personalities have their favorites that they get behind, that they're always making polls or tweeting or bringing on their show just to try to hype them up. And, and it is what it is, you know. But at the end of the day is I know what I'm capable of. I know what I put in. You know, there's a reason I have this cast on. I, I, I work myself to a certain point to where, you know, I, I'm willing to sacrifice whatever it takes to, to be the best. And right now I am the best. So, you know, uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, people are always going to say who they think is going to be the next guy to dethrone you. And it's just my job to prove them wrong. And last thing, uh, you mentioned the George St. Pierre record, but another record you're coming close to is Anderson Silva's, you know, 16 and 0, starting the UFC longest winning streak ever. Is that something you have your eyes on? And you know, obviously you feel you're never going to lose, but how far do you think you can take this unbeaten streak to start your run? You know, to be honest, I never even, I don't even look at those things. I, I remember when I, when I was coming in and fighting for that, uh, the Ultimate Fighter title, I was five and one, and I remember I used to look at guys, and I, when I first started, I'm like, man, I was. Rashad Evans at the time had just gone on like a 15 or fight win streak. I was like, how, how can I get there? How can I get to where I'm like 20 and 0 and 21 and this and all these guys have all these fights? But I don't pay attention to it. I just took it one fight at a time. Next thing you know, people are telling me that I'm 10 and 1 and 12 and 1 and that I'm, I started the UFC 5 and 0 and, and they're making all these things. So that's not something that I pay attention to. When I go in there and continuously do my job, the records would pile up. The only reason I know about that whole George St. Pierre one is because everyone was talking about it after. I saw a couple of polls about it. And so that's when I, I, I actually realized it. And, I, and I, I thought to myself, man, yeah, you know what? George St. Pierre is a guy that I watched for a long, long time. So. You know, how, how amazing would that be to break that record against that man that's still doing it at the highest level? So, you know, that's a fight that intrigues me. Uh, truly, it would be the best versus the best. Uh, uh, Kamaro, you were, to stay on the, the GSP topic, I'm right in the front. Okay. Um, you have mentioned that you want to fight GSP. There's also been some talk that Khabib would like to fight GSP. You guys have the same management. So how would that really work uh, internally? Is there a pecking order that you guys have? Would George be the one to decide? How would that work? We'll fight it out and beat the manager up and decide. <laughs> no, um, it doesn't matter. I, I think, um, there's, see, there's a reason we want to fight George. 
You know, because George George cemented a legacy. Like he he went out there and did his job. He was one of the best, respectable guy, and, and he wasn't one of these new school guys that that, that you know was talking and. and and trying to be what, what they're not, you know, George was a true mixed martial artist. And so he proved that he was the best. And now there's a reason myself and Khabib want to fight George because we want to prove that we're the best. You know, it's nothing negative. It's not that we're looking for a money fight or this and that. You know, we just want to prove that we're the best. And, and that's what you do when you see a guy that's, that, that's the best or was the best. And which is the reason why these guys are calling me out right now. You know, I don't have to call them out. I didn't call out Conor McGregor. He's the one talking about he wants to challenge me because I sit at the throne right now. So, you know, that's what we that's the way that we see the GSP. So it's not it's not necessarily anything malicious or us trying to chase a money fight or anything. I don't give a shit about a money fight. You know, the money will come as I continuously do my job. So you know, we just want to be the best. We just want to prove that we're the best. So, but internally, we'll have to fight it out, I guess. <laughs> and then just really short, what is, in retrospect, what is the single best thing about beating Colby Covington? Uh, I, 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 you know, nothing malicious at all. I, I, I never really, towards the end of that, I know he said a lot. He taught, said a lot, said a lot of things. But at the end of the day, I didn't necessarily, I wasn't trying to hurt him and, and, and you know, and to where he couldn't go back to his family and be okay. You know, that's not my intent ever again. I'm a competitor. I just want to beat them competing. And so, um, you know, at the end of the day, I guess it's just silencing all the doubters, I guess, and just proving to myself that I can go through that chaotic situation and still prevail. So I would say that probably the best thing about it.